I'm Josh Bernstein. The colonization of Roanoke Island in the late 16th century marked the very beginning of the British colonial venture in the Americas. Here in England, Queen Elizabeth I wanted to settle the New World, challenging rival Spain's colonies in Florida and the West Indies. Gaining a foothold in the New World for the British meant aiming a little farther to the north, toward America's mid-Atlantic coastline, on the other side of this ocean. May 8, 1587. Over 100 English pioneers set sail from the port town of Plymouth. Their benefactor, Sir Walter Raleigh, had already commissioned two previous expeditions to Roanoke Island. Both groups returned to England with news of the region's potential for settlement. Raleigh entrusted his third expedition to fulfill the Queen's charge, to build England's first permanent colony in the Western Hemisphere. After many months at sea, Sir Walter Raleigh's third expedition finally reached these waters. The 117 men, women, and children left their larger ships and rode ashore on small boats like this, called a shallop. John White, veteran of Raleigh's second Roanoke expedition, would serve as the colony's governor. Traveling with his pregnant daughter, Eleanor, White finally arrived along the northern shores of Roanoke Island after nearly three months at sea. According to White's recovered letters and journals, the 1587 colonists were determined to succeed, and with good reason. Sir Walter Raleigh had offered 500 acres of virgin American territory to any man willing to colonize this new world. Roanoke Island rests within the outer banks of eastern North Carolina. I've come here to begin my search for the lost colony. Hey, Nick. I've asked Nick Hotel. Lucchetti, archaeologist for the First Colony Foundation, to meet me at the north end of the island. This is great. Should we take a look? Okay. If I were standing here 420 years ago, what did this place look like? There's been a significant loss of land due to the rise in the sea level and especially severe erosion at the north end of the island. So the shoreline was actually out further? That's right. How far? Well, some estimates put it as much as a quarter of a mile. Quarter mile. So if the colonists were camped anywhere in that quarter mile, we would have lost all evidence of their settlement. Right. All that archaeological evidence would be lost. So have archaeologists been able to find any evidence that they settled here? In fact, archaeological excavations have found evidence of the Roanoke settlements on some high ground. Wow, Nick. Nick and I hike into Fort Raleigh National Forest, well, we chose this area. last known address of the lost colony. For over 20 years, this is where Nick and other archaeologists have collected evidence of the Raleigh expeditions. We dug a series of test holes and test trenches in this area. Right here? Right around us, yes. Wow. I mean, this wouldn't look to me like an archaeological site. Did you find anything? If you hold out your hands, I will put some of the artifacts that we found. Okay. Here. Lead ball, piece of flint, a very tiny piece of a crucible, and these are two sherds of a Spanish olive jar. So these would be from Sir Walter Raleigh's expeditions? That's right. That's amazing. Wouldn't it seem like if 115, 116 people were living here, you'd find more than this? You would think so. It doesn't appear that this was the village site. However, we do need to do more work here. The search continues for the lost colonists. For over 100 years, archaeologists have been digging on Roanoke Island and throughout eastern North Carolina in search of the lost colony. The few artifacts that have been recovered to date don't tell us much about the colonists' experiences on the island. But one item, discovered over 50 miles away in a 16th century Indian stronghold, points to how far afield the settlers may have journeyed. This ring. This signet ring bears the insignia of Master Kindle, who we know was on Sir Walter Raleigh's 1585 expedition. It was found on Croatan, later known as Hatteras Island. The question is, how did it get there? Did he lose it? Did he trade it, or was he killed for it? To answer these questions, I need to understand what life was really like for the colonists more than 400 years ago. Fortunately, 
There is an English colony whose experiences in the New World mirrors that of the Roanoke settlements. I'm heading 150 miles north to Jamestown, Virginia. Established in 1607, Jamestown became England's first permanent American colony, nearly 20 years after the Roanoke colony disappeared. Both Jamestown and Roanoke shared one common problem, hostile Indian neighbors. To protect their settlements from attack, the English created wooden fortifications known as palisades. To find out just how important these barricades were to the basic survival of the colonists, I'm going to meet historic Jamestown's senior archaeologist, Dr. Bill Kelso. He and his staff are building a palisade wall using the same tools available to the Jamestown colonists in the early 17th century. Thank you. Ah, making a palisade, huh? We're hard at it, yes, sir. Do you guys mind if I interrupt? Just Not at all. Look? Give us a hand. It's really good, tight. What's a, in theory, a... erecting a palisade is simple. Tree trunks are split, placed upright in a trench, and connected by wooden pegs driven through crossbeams. An electric drill would be nice. It would. <laughs> in practice, Building a palisade was a massive undertaking. In 1607, the men in the camp labored for weeks before completing the nearly 1,000-foot-long barricade at Jamestown. 20 years earlier, when they were on Roanoke Island, would they have been making palisades there? Yeah, and I, they'd be doing the same thing. The people that, that uh, tried that settlement uh, also had experience of, of fighting in wars in Europe, and they, and they were doing palisades like this there. Okay. Now it's my turn to do some heavy lifting. Bill and his team will show me just how hard it was to build these immense structures at the time. When John White returned to Roanoke Island in 1587, he was able to repair and reconstruct the palisade left behind by Raleigh's second expedition. But in 1607, the Jamestown settlers had to start from scratch. Constructing Jamestown's palisade required harvesting 600 oak and walnut trees and splitting them into over 1,500 15 foot tall posts. Based on written accounts from the first settlers, working with rudimentary tools like these took a heavy toll on the Jamestown colonists. I've been working here for only a few minutes and I'm already starting to feel it. Coming through? You know, Bill, how long it would take to put together a palisade? It took him uh, 19 days on, the, on record to do the entire fort. That's maybe 20 men erecting nearly 80 posts or 50 feet of palisade per day. Hard work, but these barriers were essential to the protection of the English settlers. Within these wooden walls, a small group of colonists could build homes, store vital provisions, and defend themselves from Indian attack. Buried three to four feet into the earth, these giant fences were able to withstand hurricane winds. I think it's solid. Give it a test. Push on it. It's a little loose, but I think it'll tighten up when yeah. the ground gets solid. So I understand the connection with the Palisades, but what other connections are there between Jamestown and Roanoke? Well, when the first colonists came in here in 1607, the Jamestown colonists, they were instructed to look for the lost colonists if they could find them. What'd they find? Well, when they first got here, and along the river, they spied a blonde-headed, light-skinned young boy. Then they sent some parties down to the south to see if they could find more, and they did run into some Native Americans who said they had seen clothed men in that area, which means Englishmen. Oh, really? So there's a possibility that 20 years later, some people were still alive. I think so. I really do. The great Indian chief Powhatan, father of Pocahontas, boasted that he had slaughtered the Roanoke colonists years before but rumors of their existence continued to circulate among the natives. Could some colonists have survived the slaughter? Was the word Croatoan etched into the Roanoke Palisade an indication of where they went? I'm on a quest to find the lost colony of Roanoke Island, over 100 English settlers who vanished in 1587. I traveled by shallop boat to the north end of the island only to discover a limited record of the colonists' existence. At the Jamestown settlement, I learned that the first search party sent to find the colonists returned with stories of their survival. But if the English did leave Roanoke Island, where did they go? 
and why. To gain a better perspective, I'm taking my search for the lost colony in an entirely new direction. Up. I've asked my old friend Bubba Peters to join me at Roanoke Island. Great to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too, man. Using Bubba's PPG, or powered paraglider, I plan to get a view of the island from above. Together, we're going to fly over Roanoke and eastern North Carolina. Getting an aerial view will allow us to examine the island's geography, the colonists' surroundings, and their possible departure points into the mainland or even the Outer Banks. The things we do in search of adventure. Prop clear. There's the north end of the island. We know from the archaeological record that 1587 colonists didn't leave many clues behind at the settlement site. And from this perspective, Roanoke appears to be too small to support a permanent and lasting English colony. the Albemarle Sound to the north, the Pamlico Sound to the south, the Outer Banks to the east, the North Carolina mainland to the west. It's clear the Roanoke colonists would have had easy access to all these points, and many historians agree that they eventually would have abandoned Roanoke Island. But in the late 16th century, warring Indian tribes dominated eastern North Carolina. Leaving the confines of the island could have cost the settlers their lives. Mm. Ah. Man, I tell you, if you want to go and explore Roanoke or this area, that is a great way to do it. I mean, the clouds over the island, it was just, it was magical. And I could really get a feel for just how much water is, obviously it's an island, so there's water, but just the number of waterways leading out from this place. It's it just, it's obvious why it's been so hard to figure out where the lost colony went. But we do know where they started. Retracing the steps of the 16th century settlers, my investigation takes me back to the last known address of the lost colony, Fort Raleigh. Well, as you can see, it's getting dark and Fort Raleigh is officially closed now. But my friends at the Park Service have been kind enough to let me actually sleep here tonight. I picked a great spot just over here and I brought some materials which the colonists would have had. Just canvas and wool for bedding. And I don't really have much of an agenda except to experience what camping and living here would be like. This place is totally new to me and it was totally new to them. So I'm gonna set up camp just see how it goes. The 117 colonists from Raleigh's third expedition consisted of gentlemen, soldiers, servants, women, and children. 